So you saw the, the, the fruits of your labor in that bus. Yeah, and, but also the fact that what made that possible was not the public I mean, uh, addressing the plight of these ladies who were saying they were, they were relating to who's playing. Mm -hmm. And uh, gradually from the first benefit on and through the early years and we, we would do a Negro voter registration drive, uh, uh, chill, uh, sending handicapped children to summer school and th these people would come to us and we would say, well, if these groups will agree to perform free of charge, we will do the producing end. They'll donate their talent, but they're really the cheese that the mice are coming towards. They're the draw. And little, uh, well, gradually, I got to realize what an awesome power that is. What a positive power. What they're able to do is to get people to come to where they're playing. People are willing to put up these dollars for, for the pleasure. They're not just going to be entertained. They're coming into that space to listen to the music, but to also meet people that they don't know, do know, and to partake in that communal spirit. The words of the artists were important to them. The lyrics were important. They related to the times and the plight of that era. And everybody seemed to win. I mean, everybody uh, left positive. We would work, uh, but stand on the side of the stage or stand by the, by the door when people left. And there was a, a very positive feel there. And I did that for a living. And I had done that kind of work for a number of years with the meme troupe. But now I was beginning to be able to have some of the things I just couldn't afford before. I had a car that worked. I was able to have things I never had before on a material level. But far greater than that, an opportunity for a means of expression. That you get to a point in life where you either throw it in and you're going you're gonna to take that job and bowl on Tuesdays and uh, fish with the friends on the weekends or you're going to get uh, that part in that play. For, for me, at the time, gradually I came to realize that my role was in the one-take world of theater, living theater, not with the public that goes to see a Broadway play and sits in row R, seats 101, 103. It was a different species. The 60s had people going to a different type of theater. And we, we had a job, but it was a, we had the privilege of saying, what can we do to affect this space? I mean, the given is that the, they, they are coming to see the birds. They are coming to see Jefferson Airplane. But knowing that uh, we would sell all those tickets, who else can we put on the show? The agents didn't know, didn't know yet that they could force things on me, on us, mm -hmm. and that they weren't managers. The managers were the guys in the, from the neighborhood. You're the drummer, you're the bass player, you're the singer, you're the manager. Because <laughs> he was the guy who didn't play and he hung out with the band. But in, in, in dealing with these people, I was allowed to put the other bands on. And again, what could I do? I'd gotten to know some of these musicians and I became f uh, friendly with uh, Paul Butterfield and Mike Bloomfield and uh, Yoma Kalkinen and some of the, uh, Jerry Garcia. And I got to talk to some of these musicians. They would, they would tell me who their heroes were. And some of their heroes were alive, the guys that they copped licks from. And I 
then called, I went to Chicago, and I went to Detroit and found the Staple Singers. I went to Macon, Georgia, and found Otis Redding, because every musician I talked to said, Otis Redding's the cat, man. I didn't know who Otis Redding was, but then I had the opportunity to have an R&B band. Martha and the Vandellas would play with Quicksilver Messenger Service. I would uh, put The Grateful Dead and Miles Davis on the same show, or I would do a uh, one-act play by Leroy Jones with The Birds and put these strange combinations together. And they were awesome experiences for all of us. But far beyond that was what happened to you when you came to our place and I ripped your ticket. What happens when you come inside? What do you see? What do you feel? What if you're inhibited? So little by little we would try to deal with you. Who are you coming into this space before the band played on the stage? Relative to who's coming, who is that artist drawing? What kind of tape do we put on as you walk in? Well, let's deal with the inhibited guy. Let's put a barrel of apples at the door and just say, take one or two and watch people take an apple and they see it's free. They'll take two and they'll take five and they'll hoard them and go into the building. Or, or what would happen if we put balloons on the floor and there's an inhibited guy and a balloon comes towards him, will he bat it back? Uh, we take news events of the day and we'd, I'd, I'd cork, I corked the whole wall and put news clippings up there, something out of Life magazine, the birth of a caterpillar, whatever it might be. And we'd put those things on the wall and, and hopefully you might be eating into a biting an apple, reading something, a balloon comes towards you, the music starts and you don't even know it. You're, you're okay. You're okay, and you, and you might have come there with your Saturday night outfit, you know, with your Saturday night date, and maybe a month later or three or four visits later, you're okay, and that space is okay, and it's a place that uh, maybe you escaped, and maybe you had to get wasted from your your out of outside problems. But about a year after uh, we opened, I went to the at men's room. And I heard somebody said something which will always be the definitive compliment to our company. And there were three urinals, and I was standing in the middle urinal, and two guys came in. And the show was The Cream, The Butterfield Blues Band, and Charlie Musselwhite. That was the show. And these two guys came in, and one stood in the accident. Well, you don't know, but three guys, you know, the bathroom, you always stand like this. So this one guy just like, talked straight ahead, and he said, uh, Holy shit, man, who's playing tonight? And the other guy, without missing a beat, just said, I don't know, man, but what's the difference? It's the Fillmore. That was it. That was in uh, October of 1966. October 11th. Uh, that's the work. And to make, to make that work, you've got, you've got to take how you feel about that kind of work and get other people in the company to feel that way about it, maybe they, maybe when you hired them, they already had that, and if they if they didn't, you hope by osmosis they get it. That, that, that is that's what has that's what hasn't changed. The attempt to retain that is what work is all about. How do you main, how do you attempt to maintain that when you go from three people to four hundred people? from one building and one job to a company with divisions and guys that have titles and you have tax consultants. Then when biz big business comes to music. Right. Well, Tell me about that after Woodstock, what that, how that changed your job, made it harder. It changed the power structure more than anything. The, the, the power should always belong to the person that makes it all possible. I mean the diamond, without the diamond the polisher is nothing, the setter is nothing, the wholesale is nothing. But the, so that the source is the artist. But then the artist, in order to deal with the business world, needs a manager. The manager then hires a guy to book the tour, who is the agent. Then you have the promoter in the fourth position, then there's the public. So there's a power structure there. And as the years passed, the manager standing in place of the artist began to wield tremendous power as he should if he's a decent human being I mean 
to one artist decent means make me as much money as you can. But he should also say, when I become very famous and hundreds of thousands of people want to see me and we go into that town, don't put six goons around me for security and anybody gets in the way, move them aside physically. Many artists at that time allowed those things to happen because they just didn't deal with it. It was the music and fame and power. A few years later, in, uh, when, when a half a million people showed up at Woodstock, Mass America just said, oh, what is this? How much soda did they sell there? How much was made from parking? Uh, how many trucks were used? How many people were employed? Rightly so. It's a big business. But gradually, America wins. Big biz doesn't lose to small biz. You have, to, you have to work very hard to retain that element which was the main reason you went into whatever it is that you do. Uh, I lose it sometimes and I, uh, there were things that I've had to do in dealing with big business that I wish I'd, I didn't have to. But there, are, there are many artists now that appear on our stage that has my name on it where I didn't choose the, the opening act. The headline act says, you want chopped liver? You take pickled herring with it. I don't think you heard me. You want chopped liver? You're going to take pickled herring with it. Sometimes when the artists uh, and I have a different relationship, it's pleasurable again. But then again, it's 20 years later. Rock and roll is not the music of the alternative society. You, can't, you can practically not see the, the alt if there is one. There are pockets of individuals, and there aren't communes out there, but there are pockets of groups. And people in, that, in those times did have hope that our country was going in a different direction. It's now, it's now sheer survival time with the mass young, and we, we're generalizing now. When people went to a show in the 60s. Most of the time, they went for the act and the experience. Today, 95% of the time, people go to be entertained, period. They don't go to exchange communal spirit. That communal spirit is within their home, on that floor in that apartment building, maybe on the block, but more often than not, it just, it's not there. It's, uh, to, me that's, to me, that's probably the single saddest aspect of the change in our society, by far. And, I, and I, whenever I get a chance, I, I mention uh, the Grateful Dead only because when they play, especially in the Bay Area, and more so than in other parts, because we work very hard at having no big brother attitude there. The, the law lets us run that space. And they walk on the stage, and somebody, uh, 5,000 people may be there, 10,000 people may be there. And uh, they'll be there hours before sitting outside the play, playing frisbee, playing. We put up a volleyball net, and they'll play volleyball. But they pretty much come in there with such a neighborhood spirit that hasn't changed in all these years. And I can't say that for other events, but you can hear two people come in and neither one has ever met any one of the Grateful Dead. They've seen hundreds of their shows and you, you're apt to hear one say to the other, uh, Mickey looks a little thinner. It's like talking about a cousin. That. That was there all the time for those years. And to, to do that, to do that, uh, to work in that uh, milieu on a regular basis and then stand at the side of the stage and feel that you're a part of it, feel that you've... I've always tried to simplify what we do by saying we're the parsley on the plate. You may not eat it, but somehow 
it might make the presentation that a little bit more. It's like making sure the coffee is coffee, and making sure that the jars are clean, and making a, making a combination happen on stage that might not have happened if we didn't throw our two cents in. The ecstasy, though, was that era, and we just, we still try to put out good wine, but it's so much more difficult to harvest. What was it about this place and that time that made it such fertile ground for bands, for young bands? Well, I think more than anything, I think it was, a, it, was the, it was something that existed way before that era and still exists. For an urban area, there's a laissez-faire attitude in the greater Bay Area, Oakland, Area. That's very, very special. I can't speak against Chicago, against Detroit, but th there's been that openness here. I mean, in the 60s, you could have busted any floor in any hotel anytime you wanted to. They didn't. There's also something that I've felt in the Bay Area that I've always thought of it as a city made up predominantly by professional rejects from other parts of the country and the world. It's as if they say, well, I would have been, I would have really wanted to earn my living and make my statement as a writer in New York or as a ballet dancer in London or as a cinematographer in LA, but I didn't get the break or I don't have the talent, but what can I get out of life? If nothing else, I'm gonna live somewhere where it's beautiful and the people seem to be better balanced where I can at least get a shot at, ex at expressing my sincere neutrality towards my fellow man. I think the Bay Area gives you that more than any other place in the United States. Again, generalizing about who we all are and how we mean to express ourselves. Um, I've been to most major cities in the United States. I've been fortunate to visit most major cities outside the United States. If you're going to live in America, in the United States, you get up in the morning here in, on, on foot, on, by, on bike, on motor, motor, whatever, any way you get outside. It's lovely here. It's a beautiful area to live in. I live in Marin County. And I'm not saying every day I sit there agog, but on a regular basis, I, I'm, I'm, I'm reminded just instinctively reminded why the, the the times and what you what you hear through the media and the madness of the world we live in uh, there's something very special about the area combining nature the people that have migrated here the people that have been here all along the fact that it's generally a bourgeois town which is okay with me I'm lucky because of my work that I'm, I'm in New York a dozen times a year. I mean, I'm in Europe three, four times a year. Go to the Orient often enough. So I'm very lucky that way. But when that plane hits down here, as it did today, it's still, uh, I've been gone for 10 days. There's no place, there is no other place that I would rather make as my home base. There isn't a close second.